and welcome to this Open University webinar, Creating a Sustainable Skills Strategy to Attract Future Talent. I'm Priya Lakhani and I'm hosting this panel discussion in which we'll be discussing the Open University's Business Barometer Report, published in partnership with the Institute of Directors. The report analyses the UK skills landscape, which investigates the size, nature and impact of the skills gap across different nations, regions and sectors. It is based on a survey of 1,500 UK employers across the public, private and third sectors. We are going to split today's webinar into two parts. The first part will look at some of the key findings from the Business Barometer Report. We will discuss what the future of the workplace looks like and the skills, challenges and opportunities that presents to employers. The second part will look at the report findings on the current skills shortage and what organisations are doing and should be doing to achieve a sustainable skills strategy. I am delighted to ask our expert panel to introduce themselves, starting with Laura, Roger and then Matt. Hello, so I'm uh, Laura Burley from the Open University. So I lead on apprenticeships and skills policy here at the OU. Um, I'm passionate about learn and earn uh, agenda and how it can open up opportunities for businesses and individuals. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Roger Barker. I'm Director of Policy and Governance at the Institute of Directors, where I'm responsible for our public policy activities, trying to influence government to create a business environment that is favourable to business, enterprise and good governance. Hello everybody, I'm Matt Flanley. I head up marketing at Datactics. We're a 60 person data quality and matching software firm based in the heart of Belfast, looking out over, over the River Lagan. Thank you so much, Roger, Laura and Matt. Now, before we dive in, let's take stock of the last year. Pre-COVID, businesses were preparing for Brexit, for changes to our supply chains, funding sources and our talent pool. COVID struck, catalyzed change in some of those areas and fundamentally shifted the way in which people work, interact and consume. Now, many UK business leaders are really optimistic about the future, despite the last year's instability and uncertainty. And as we emerge from the pandemic, we need to adapt. And talent acquisition and retention is and ought to be a primary objective for many. For part one of this webinar, I'd like to invite the expert panel to dive into a discussion on the skills the future workplace will require. Now, we know that the workplace is changing at an unprecedented rate, and this creates both challenges and opportunities, but only surely if we're aware of what shifts are taking place. Laura, firstly, can I ask you to tell us, what does the business barometer reveal on organisations transitioning to remote and hybrid working models? So we all know that uh, four in five organisations transition to at least some kind of remote working during the pandemic. And of those who transitioned, nearly a third of those we polled said it, they transitioned all employees. And I think what's the interesting part of the 2021 business barometer is that it found that in the future, 86% of firms that transitions will continue to work remotely in some capacity. And four, uh, sorry, one in four, they will give up on a fixed workplace entirely. So that's really fascinating. And Roger, do you have anything to add in terms of what you're seeing at the Institute of Directors? Yes, we, we've also surveyed our members and there is very much, I think, an embrace of this concept of hybrid working, although there are different conceptions of what that's actually going to mean in practice. I mean, we asked a very broad question, you know, would you be open to the idea of somewhere between one and four days per week remaining working at home, um, if that's indeed possible for your organisation? And a majority of our members um, were in agreement with that. They said that, you know, that's a, an objective that we want to pursue. I mean, some, of course, I think see perhaps a majority of time in the office with three, three four days a week in the office. Others look at it the other way. They, they see now actually the weight of time being actually working from home. But in broad terms, the, the idea of hybrid working is something that they really want to embrace going forward. Laura. So in terms of how this may relate to skill shortages, um, the business prompt shows there's some optimism around the potential for remote working to fill skills gaps. So almost two thirds of our respondents said that remote working provides an opportunity to recruit people who don't 
uh, live nearby to fill the skill shortages. So I think this transition to home working is going to be really key as we look forward in terms of, of plugging skills gaps. 64%, for example, think that it'll represent an opportunity for organisations outside of London and the South East to fill the skills gaps. And I think, obviously, it'll be some time before we see the full effects of the kind of the working from home experiment on regional recruitment. But the skill spread, we think, is likely to look very different in five years' time. And so I'd like to bring Matt into the discussion. So, Matt, from the business side of things, what are you currently doing around remote and hybrid working at Day Tactics? Uh, thanks. It's, it's really fascinating to hear the, the, the two insights from, from Roger and from Laura on this, because um, for, for us during the pandemic, we... Um, we, we obviously went to a, a completely remote workforce like, like everybody did. Um, and being an IT firm, that was uh, relatively easy, although our head of DevOps is probably not going to thank me for saying it was easy. Um, but very quickly, we realised that if for, for a company like us, you know, 60 people attempting to take on multi-billion dollar competitors um, in our marketplace, we do our best work collectively when, when we're all, you know, at least in, in a similar room to one another. Um, and we were quite keen to, to, to sort of transition back to that as, as quickly as we possibly could. Uh, we actually took on extra office space uh, to be able to facilitate social distancing in the office as, as soon as we could. Um, and, and we found that that has really balanced well with, with, with what our workforce is, is, is trying to uh, achieve and what they want. Uh, because as well, you know, IT in Belfast is quite a, a young average uh, age demographic, which I'm delighted to say um, and pretend that I'm still a part of. Um, and, and, and what we've then tried to do, emerging from the worst of, of what the pandemic's thrown at us, is, is explore what hybrid working would look like for, for our workforce. And, and Roger's point is actually very, very on point. We've looked at uh, around a day uh, a week worked remotely um, because perhaps that's a bit of flexibility that people were, were looking for. Um, I have two children, um, so I'm delighted to be in the office as often as possible and then just provide father work outside of their, their school hours and outside of my, my office hours. Uh, but we, we see that as being um, a, a big opportunity to differentiate, particularly in a backdrop of, of Belfast, which is not as compact and compressed a city as London, um, but also features an awful lot of um, software development jobs from foreign direct investment firms. Uh, so we have to find a way of being able to differentiate what, what our company is doing and providing that support to people, providing a place that's been actually for a lot of people a refuge uh, because it's got reliable internet and they're not having to try and share it with three other housemates. Um, has, 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 been, has been something that's worked extremely well for us thus far, and we're hoping to, to, to continue uh, on into 2022 and beyond. And Matt, at Century, you know, we're a growing company as Day Tactics is, and what we found is that leadership's had to be really agile in terms of as things move on, as we survey um, our staff, as we learn about who wants hybrid, who wants to work from home, who needs an office, who prefers that sort of collaboration face to face. We've had to adapt in terms of our office space. That's not always the easiest thing to do, particularly if you're tied into long leases. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And, um, you know, we, we, we have been very fortunate in the sense that we've been able to negotiate some pretty good uh, arrangements with our landlords on, on our office building. We have a slightly bizarre um, setup here in the sense that I'm speaking to you from one office in our building, we have two other offices in this building, and you have to walk outside to get to both of them. Um, but we, we sort of, again, maybe that's part of your agile leadership piece, um, being able to roll with the punches and find a different way of doing things that isn't just Crikey, we've just got to hide and then wait until this is over. Um, I, I sort of acknowledge that in cities like London and Manchester and, and, and Glasgow and Edinburgh, it's, it's perhaps a bit more of a challenge when office space is um, at such a, pre such a premium and people were used to being almost sort of working in and on top of each other, which doesn't work when you're trying to, to, to socially distance. Uh, but, but listening to people, involving people, we, we held a, a strategy day, which we would do anyway, we, we sort of do two or three of these a year, uh, and we got a huge amount of, of feedback from, from everybody really in, in the company of both the pros and the cons of, of remote working, and then tried to chart a path through that. We've, we're doing this as a, um, as, a, as a pilot approach between now and the end of the year, and we'll continue to kind of get that feedback, because I think unless you involve everybody in, in understanding how, how that it's benefiting or, or impacting on their lives, um, you're, you're gonna sort of lose people along the way and you end up with the risk of people silently switching um, to, to another job, which obviously in, in 
the IT sector you, you particularly can't afford right now. Oh, absolutely. And I think there's lots of data at the moment on attrition, isn't there? And the fact that people are changing their jobs, it's something that they can change in their lives. But that is something that businesses are going to have to grapple with. Recruitment, as we know, is incredibly expensive. It's not just the recruitment fees, but also salary inflation, which we're seeing, particularly across the technology sector, which spans uh, all industries. Now, Roger, you have so many members at the Institute of Directors. And as this physical location of work becomes more flexible, what are they saying and what are you seeing in terms of the opportunities and the benefits that that brings? Or is it is it a hindrance on business? Um, are people being agile? Are they finding that actually, you know, they're far more risk averse and they don't want to change? Yeah, I think it, this is a fairly unique moment, actually, in terms of how businesses are looking at flexible working and how how the, the the workforce is looking at it and it's um i suppose to some extent we, we still have the hangover of the pandemic you know that, that that is creating a kind of vestigial reluctance on behalf of some employees to to want to come back back into the workplace um but over time i think you know that that will that will dissipate and I think both employees and employers will need to, will then need to think what do they really want to do you know put in, put to one side concerns about um you know the the virus and and becoming infected what actually is going to work for them in terms of their you know longer term uh, way of working and it, at the moment I think to some extent we're stepping into the unknown um you know employers are looking at their premises and if they if they're coming to the end of a lease and their employment uh, their employment surroundings don't really offer something really meaningful and interesting for their employees going forward they're asking themselves the question should we actually con- continue with this on the other hand if they have something which is uh, very modern which is going to actually help them get their employees back into to the office and in, and 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 excite them in 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 um being together again then that's a different matter and and what i've heard talk of is that the commercial property market is actually almost splitting into t- to kind of two tiers between these different types of of property um but i think that you know that it's undoubtedly true that there are some employees who are who are reluctant to come back into the office for, you know the costs of commuting, the concerns about uh, COVID, um, and just you know the sheer sort of inertia they got settled into a new way of working at home. How do you actually um, demonstrate to them that, that, that actually that there's another possibility and there's some real benefits of being back together in the office at least some of the time and, and as a team? And that, that those these are the things which I think management are grappling with at the moment. Yeah, so the challenge is grappling with that and then measuring productivity at the same time. You know, if we're having all these changes and we're seeing all these changes, well, you know, businesses still need to be productive. Businesses will be still very focused on that bottom line, which obviously took um, quite a hit in many of the sectors over the last uh, 18 months. Now, I'm going to turn to our business barometer guru here because as businesses, we love data and we love the analysis that you've been able to provide us. So, Laura, the report findings also showed some really interesting insights on recruitment. Can you share a little bit more with us? So there's so many insights in the business barometer on recruitment. So I'm delighted that you've asked that question, Priya. For example, the lack of skills have led to length in recruitment times and the money they're spending on recruitment continues to rise. So 41% of businesses have reported they'll spend more money on recruitment than in the past year. Of those struggling to recruit, half are spending money on temporary staff to fit, to plug the skills gaps. And this is much more acute in small and medium-sized businesses. One thing I would say is that we've all been you know, very cognizant of at the moment is staff wellbeing. And one thing we found is half of businesses polled, or over half, 56%, said that vacancies have led them to overextending their workforce. And that's you know, hugely impacting staff wellbeing. And there's lots of data and insight in there on growth potential. So lots of businesses are saying that the skills shortages are massively affecting their growth potential. And it was particularly marked in smaller companies. So 65% of businesses with 51 to 100 staff said that this was the case. I guess the headline is the skills gaps being felt across every level and every sector this year. Um, So the business barometer shows that 61% of businesses believe they have a a current uh, skill shortage in their organisation. 
and this is more acute in, in sectors such as agriculture, forestry and fishing, pharmaceuticals and the arts, entertainment and recreation. And also, I think as many people in the audience will know, the OU's business barometer is an annual report and that we've been tracking this for a while now and the stat around skill shortages has remained virtually unchanged over the last few years. So I think this is really indicating it's a long-term problem for em employers. Obviously, ob as we, we know, it's more um, newsworthy and, and noticeable at the moment. In terms of geographies, Northern Ireland reports the most acute skill shortages. And within in England, we see that London, the North West and the North East um, have reported the most concern. And finally, I think what is most interesting for me is given all that's going on in terms of econo economic growth and recovery at the moment and the focus on that on the agenda is that a quarter of all of the businesses polled said that recruiting the right talent remains the single biggest challenge that they face, they will face in the next five years. That's fascinating. And as a business leader of a, of a growing scale up, I have to say that makes me very nervous. Um, I would agree with that as well. I think at Century has certainly been um, a challenge and, and that has been a combination of factors of, of Brexit and COVID that we have directly seen, um, you know, within the technology sector. Now, I recently worked with the Open University on the Finding the Future campaign. It was a, a fantastic day and we helped to identify the top five jobs, which included sustainability officer, AI developer, digital content strategist, cybersecurity penetration expert and renewables engineer. And now despite the diversity of skill sets that were represented and careers within the group of people that came together to identify these jobs, I actually wasn't very surprised that the roles spanned technology and sustainability. And so Roger, I'd really be keen to hear your thoughts on what new jobs and roles do you think will be needed in the future? And then let's follow up with Matt and how he saw Sourcing, um, some of these skill sets and roles and what he's finding um, as he grows his company. So Roger first. Yeah, I think that what the pandemic did uh, was that it accelerated trends that were already in place, but, but were, were proceeding at a certain speed and that the, the pandemic just supercharged them, basically. And, and for me, the you know, those trends were all about you know greater reliance on technology and the digital business environment and secondly uh, you know a, a great an even more of an emphasis on how we um, adjust to climate change how do we de decarbonize our economy um, and how not only do, do we do that from a kind of protective uh, in a protective way but also as a business opportunity and i for me you know the 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 key areas of, of skill shortage for the future, um, you know, relate to those areas. And Priya, I think, you know, the, the very much the sort of job, um, the job roles and the job titles that you were describing there are, are all sort of allied to them. Um, the, the question is, where do we get these, where do we get these, uh, the people with the right skills to fill these kind of roles from? Um, what sort of training process, what sort of qualification route do, do they need to go along? And there, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a, still a lot of uncertainty about how we achieve that, you know, do, is the conventional university route going to be the right route for all of these new roles? Um, if not, is our vocational training framework, you know, which has many components from further education to apprenticeships and other types of qualification, is that going to be sufficient, adequate and sufficient to, to meet these needs? Um, you know, because I think that, the, you know, these are new roles, the roles of the future, they are newly defined roles. Um, we don't necessarily have um, a ready framework, an easy template, um, which we can use to train the, these types of people. And I think business, government, the Department of Education, um, you know, the local communities need to all come together to, to, to actually develop the right training and skills development routes for all of these new roles. Thank you. So, Matt, tell us, what's the secret? Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely come up with a secret. I think, so if I, if I look back, I, I joined Did Tactics four years ago and um, we were a team of about 15, 16 people. And you'll know yourself, Priya, that you can, you can pretty much agree 
where you are with the company strategy in a five minute meeting on a Monday and then you're set. But when you get to uh, scale that company and you're around 60 people and we've still ambitions to, to, to add more, you have to have a, a way of being able to communicate that value and what you're trying to achieve because you're all unified to get in the same passion to, to take on big players in your market, to lead in your field. Um, and so for us, we, we, look at, we look at the motivations of people who, who, are, who are qualifying either as brand new grads in computer science, particularly for, um, for, for development roles, or are a bit more experienced. And then we also look at um, what other people who are working in industry or who have worked in industry and perhaps are looking for a way back um, in, into, into a role like this. Um, but perhaps have come from a maths or English background because you know language skills and mathematical ability are fundamentals when it comes to understanding data quality, data matching and the technology that underpins it. And allied to that, what we've tried to do is we've looked at our own platform and understood what parts of that could people learn, reasonably learn, without necessarily needing to come from a technical, technical background. We, we just literally just launched a data academy to, uh, to help train up people and give them certification um, over the course of a year, uh, which will help people understand parts of, of what the platform can do, helps make them useful on, on extremely valuable company projects to us, because, you know, a growing company like us, every customer we win is, is, is like a family member. Um, and and that's, that's perhaps helped us to kind of bridge that skills gap between uh, a, a workforce that is, that is keen to, passionate to develop themselves, apply themselves to this burgeoning technological um, economy that we have based here in, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, but lacks some of just a little bit of entry criteria to be able to get into, um, to, to get into working in a role like that. So we'll, we'll bridge that gap, we'll work with people. It's our intention to be able to um, hold on to as many people as possible from, from that, uh, from that con consultant role that we'll have over the course of the year. Um, and, and that's probably the, the strongest thing that we've done um, over the last few months in terms of um, d developing this data academy, um, uh, which, which we're, we're actually really, really enthused by the, uh, the, the level of response and the variety of the type of applicant that, that has, 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 has put, pitched their hat in the ring for that thus far. Uh, and we see that as being, it's, it is kind of reskilling, upskilling, but, but realistically it's, it's about the passion, it's what drives people. Um, and in a company like ours, again, you'll know this yourself, Priya, you do genuinely have that opportunity to not just be another cog in the wheel, but, but to lead on a, on a project within, within months of, of, of being there at, at a company. And that exposure, that fulfilment, I think is one of the things, one of those purposes that people most identify with when it comes to the, the sort of the holistic value of, of working in an organisation beyond, is it nine to five? Where do I work? What do I get paid? Thank you so much, Matt. Now, it'd be remiss of me not to talk about the C word, culture. Peter Drucker famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Matt, you touched on strategy. We've talked about collaboration. Roger's been talking about members and what they've been looking at doing and how it fundamentally will affect businesses if we're not looking at different working environments and trying to engage people. Are we at risk? of, in a sense, unravelling the last decade of investment that companies have put in into establishing a strong work culture which aligns with their strategy so that you can produce those goals and create the values and behaviours in an organisation that, that produces those values um, and those goals that you want to achieve. Are we at risk of losing that? while having to grapple with um, a hybrid working model or people working from home. So Matt, can you tackle that? And how are you managing to achieve that strong work culture at Day Data Access while, you, while you're building the business? It's, it's, a, it's a really important question and something that we, uh, we, we, we focus on an awful lot. We, we have, um, we, we're really proud to have a culture that uh, being a tech company uh, tries to be as diverse as, as is possible. Um, so we, we've a, a pretty industry trend bucking uh, percentage of, of, of women in our company, somewhere around 35%, um, needs to be more, obviously, um, which, which obviously then provides uh, a much more balanced uh, environment for people to work in, particularly when it comes to the tech sector, which is so male dominated. Uh, it's so absurdly when you consider how right up until secondary school, the vast majority of people doing well in maths and in science and generally STEM subjects are, are, are girls. Um, so addressing that drop-off is really important for us and identifying with the opportunity to provide opportunities for, for women in tech in particular uh, is, is something that is part of 
the culture of working at Detactics. So you automatically know whether you're male or female, you're going to get a, a fair shot um, at, at Detactics. We maintain that continual engagement with our teams, uh, as I say, through, through the strategy, strategy days that we've, we've been running. And also a big part of why we have tra- chosen to try and uh, provide office space for more people uh, at a time when a lot of people were definitely tempted to be able to uh, to sort of cut on on costs of office space or, or was just massively impractical for them to be able to get into the office because we know that when you are around one another when you are working on the same projects when you have the opportunity to see your professional development and your voice is heard that's when you get the best opportunity to have that autonomy feel like you're in control of your career my, my experience from working in, in a big bank uh, before i joined uh, detactics was that invariably my biggest career opportunities came from uh, the moments when i was available when i was there and my boss's boss needed something done and i happened to be pretty good with powerpoint and excel you know, those, those are the things that unless you have those opportunities in front of you, which come because they are, you know, kismet, they are, they are just sort of serendipitous, um, that unless you have those, you're not going to see your career thrive. And for us, that's such a key part of our culture that we would, we would provide people with those opportunities. We just keep reinforcing that message with everybody. And it helps us differentiate from an awful lot of companies who perhaps are saying, we think we can do you can perform that role remotely and you can you know the company head office might be in chicago and you're, you're in a small office here and um and, and that's fine it might well work for them um but but we think that if we're going to keep people aligned with our culture it's through that continual um, engagement with with everybody at all levels within the company understanding what we're trying to achieve how well we're doing against it um, and what people can do to, uh, to, 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 to achieve it better, you know, that through monthly reviews, through constant contact um, and so on. That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of what we, what we thrive and what we strive to be. Thank you. I'd now like to move on to the second part of today's webinar. We're going to look at how both L&D professionals and business leaders face this new future, what approaches organisations are taking and what are the building blocks for sustainable skills strategies. Now, Laura, I'm going to ask you two questions. Firstly, what does the business barometer say about the approaches being taken by organisations to combat the skills shortage? And secondly, you are the Apprentices Ambassador for the Open University. So tell us more about apprenticeships. How can we invest in apprenticeships in our organisations to upskill and reskill our talent? So the business problem is suggesting that investing and skills in training is, is necessary for businesses and organisations to really grow and thrive. So it's not just about plugging the short term skills gra- gaps, it's about um, you know, growing your own talent for the future. Uh, and this is true for both small and, and, and large organisations. So just over a quarter have had to recruit at a lower level than expected over in the last 12 months. Um, and of those who've had to do this, though, almost four in five have spent money on training these new hires to get them up to speed. And the Business Barometer also reports that apprenticeships continue to be cited as a good way to support sustainable skills strategies. So 56% of employers believe that apprenticeships and work-based learning are critical to their long-term success. And this is an 8% increase from last year. And staggeringly, um, and I think this is certainly something that, that we as the Open University are seeing with some of the employers that, that we work with, 96% of employers currently working with apprentices plan to maintain or increase the number of apprentices in their organisation next year. So I think that's, that's great news in terms of growing your own talent and sustainable skill strategies. And I think I would say for anyone watching today that's looking into uh, the return on investment on apprenticeships, there's, there's a growing um, base of, of evidence and data out there on there now, especially in England as the apprenticeship levy policy has matured somewhat so um, for example St Martin's group of which the OU's uh, a member has recently published a retort, report that gives um, some key data about the return on investment on apprenticeships so for a business um, it can quite quickly claw back the level of investment on onboarding that apprentice and supporting that training so there is actually a net benefit very early in the business and I'll, and I'll give you an example I know Matt I'm sure will, will give examples from from his company but I was speaking to one small business um, a couple of weeks ago and they have uh, a third of their uh, employers are employees 
are apprentices. And when those apprentices go off and do their 20% off the job training on the Friday, at the end of the day, they reconvene and they, they actually share their learning that day. So it helps consolidate their learning. But that real halo effect of training where they're supporting the whole business to drive you know, productivity and inspiring them, you know, those, that company can then, you know, use that learning from Monday onwards, you know. So there's real benefits in, in those apprenticeships. And I think increasingly, as I said, you know, as businesses are seeing the benefits, you've, you've got the data then to back it up. The, this business barometer saying that 96% of plan to maintain or increase their number is, is really encouraging. And that's true uh, both among small businesses, which I think is key, uh, and large businesses, but also um, across various m- majority of regions are very consistent in terms of that and all sectors. So I think that's a really positive story going forward in terms of how you might build a sustainable strategy that is inclusive, um, driving productivity, but also crucially for, for the OU and what we believe in, in terms of widening access and diversity as well. Thank you, Laura. And that's a perfect segue then to ask Matt about his examples. And Matt, what is your approach to achieving a sustainable skills strategy? So, yeah, they, they are brilliant brilliant examples you're, you're, you're absolutely right Laura and we've we have it's, it's a funny thing is we we have come across uh, our current approach in terms of apprenticeships this data academy working with firms like uh, with, with universities like the OU um, on the basis of necessity being the mother of invention but also you know the passion that we have for the develop, development of people um, in this economy. Belfast has a fantastically strong history when it comes to engineering excellence um, and this this uh, sort of fourth industrial age of, of technology is, is no different uh, but we perhaps just need to work much more closely with education providers to be able to uh, ensure that we are actually bringing, bringing up the, the, the skill level uh, across the economy. Um, I've, we, we've two apprentices who work with us um, in, in the DevOps and security team, Victoria and Natalie, and they're both brilliant. And, I, and you're absolutely right, Laura, that ability to go off, do the day and uh, 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 do the days of the study um, over at the over at Belfast Met, which is over by the Harland and Wolf shipyard, um, quite iconically, uh, is, is, is fabulous because they bring that capability straight back into the company on Monday morning. We, we have an approach as a company from a strategic point of view that absolutely every single employee gets um, at least a day a month to train on whatever they like. So whether you want to train on something that is overtly job related, which is totally fine, or something that's going to be fulfilling, um, that's for us is, is, is what matters in terms of both the human and the employee uh, sort of combined into one. Um, so people in my team, for example, going off and saying, I'd really like to do a whole lot of Google's digital garage training. You know, it's a marketing team. I've come out of a marketing qualification and, and now I just want to understand a bit more about what else I could be doing. I'm totally on board with that. That's fabulous because I know that they're going to upskill themselves and then pose me a whole load of difficult questions on a Monday morning that I can then say, right, great, let's explore that. Um, and that, that approach is, is sort of unilateral across the company, as well as targeted training that we do around, you know, sales development and so on. But that proximity to um, encouraging people to do PhDs, encouraging people to learn on the job, learn and earn has been used as, as an expression, and that's a cornerstone of our, of our data, con- data academy for those data consultants. Um, yeah, remaining close at a strategic level to what employment needs are, sorry, what education needs our employees need um, is, uh, is, is, is critical to us because upskilling our, our employees and upskilling our capabilities just increases our competitive edge on an international stage. Thank you, Matt. Now, Roger, I think last year, Joe Fitzsimmons, who's the Head of Education and Skills Policy at the um, Institute of Directors, he uh, welcomed some moves by the government and some announcements. He talked about how more action on skills will be absolutely essential. He was really welcoming more work in terms of the SME um, apprenticeships. Um, and he was talking about a rigid system, actually, which creates a lot of headaches. I, I remember he said that. So, you know, can you tell us, it's been a year now, you know, what's the IOD's view of, has there been any movement in terms of apprenticeships and investment? Is there more that the government needs to do to help us align ourselves with what 
Laura has been expressing our company's biggest needs and requirements in terms of what the business barometer has has demonstrated in terms of the talent shortage, the skill shortage and the need to upskill, reskill and of course more apprenticeships. Yes, Priya. I think, you know, there has been um, some movement over, over the last year, but let's also recognise that um, we're now in a kind of unprecedented circumstance. You know, there's about a million vacancies in the economy, um, big shortages across a range of areas. And it's uh, the biggest factor, actually, which most of our members are saying are, are causing those shortages are, in addition, of course, to the should we say, the more well-discussed areas like the return of, of EU of people from EU member states back to the EU and, of course, also the pandemic as well. The biggest factor is actually long-term skill shortages. That, that, that's, the, that's the big driver of it. I think, you know, the government, the government does recognise this and there have been some very important announcements. I mean, I think the most fundamental one happened um, in September of last year when the government announced its lifetime skills guarantee approach, which I think is the right approach. You know, most of our members would agree that you need to have the opportunity through at different stages of your career to go back into training, to go back into education, to have this have the funding available to, to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, but that lifetime skills guarantee initiative, it still has yet to, I think, you know, realize its full potential. Um, you know, the, the government is talking about um allocating um, individuals lifetime skills guarantee budgets by by 2024 which they can use to to spend on training throughout their careers but you know 2024 is a long way away we, we I think you know the IOD argues that um that needs to be vastly accelerated right now so that that, that becomes part part of the environment right now um on a, the apprenticeship levy We've argued for a long time that there is a lack of flexibility there, that, you know, that that companies are accumulating these funds through the apprenticeship levy. Um, but it, it's there is quite a narrow range of training opportunities which which the, the levy can be spent on. Um, we would argue that it should actually be available to spend on training across a, a much wider range of areas, not just not just actually conventional apprenticeship type training, um, but also, you know, shorter courses, um, sort of investment in soft skills and, you know, really a, a range of things which could assist employees in, in retraining or upskilling. So to much more flexibility, I think, uh, need, needs to be seen there. Another thing we'd really like to see uh, uh, is a much broader ability of companies to um, deduct, deduct from their tax bill what they invest in human capital. Um, to some extent, that that is possible now, um, but it, it's it's rarely possible for, for example, sole traders. You know, if you are if you are a self-employed person and you want to invest in yourself, perhaps through some kind of uh, new qualification or training process, you know, uh, you should be able to, to to deduct that, you know, from your tax bill. Um, it's it, it just seems a reasonable thing that investment in, in um, human capital, for example, um, the, the way you know that human that investment in human capital should be seen as equivalent actually as investment in physical capital the government has introduced actually a, a super deduct deduction from corporation tax bills which are open to companies to invest in physical capital well why not make that applicable as well to investment in in human capital so that that's something that we we're calling for so i think and then you have another important government scheme is the that was introduced by the chancellor is their help to grow management scheme which is of offering um some employees the opportunity to do MBA type training, a 12 week training program um, for very little cost. So, you know, the, I suppose the picture I'm painting, Priya, is that, you know, the government is aware of this issue. It, it is introducing some um, initiatives, but I think a more systematic approach is now needed. It is quite a confusing landscape, I think. You know, if I, if I were a young person thinking, well, I don't necessarily want to go to university, I want to pursue a more vocational approach. 
there's T levels, there's there's apprenticeships, there's the kickstart scheme, there's help to grow. You know, it's all get it's all quite complicated, isn't it? And quite confusing. I think we need more of a plan and we need more of an acceleration of the, of these initiatives to to address the, the 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 problems that we're facing right now. So so you know it's it's a work in progress I would say. Thank you, Roger. I mean, I think that in in some ways the the the, the multitude of options is is a positive thing because a one size fits all approach uh, may, may not work either. But I really want to pick up on a very important point that you made, which was on flexibility, because on the one hand, you know, you have uh, all of the rungs of an organisation of leadership saying, "That's lovely. I still have to, if not increase productivity, I have to maintain it." And in order to do that, can I really afford for all of these people to be studying on a Friday? Can they be off, you know, uh, learning more and more things? I actually just kind of need them to do their job. And I need them to do it right now, particularly when we took a hit to our bottom line over the last year. So, so Laura, it's a perfect opportunity uh, to tell our viewers about online blended and flexible working. So what's the role of that in terms of engaging our young workers, allowing them to upskill, reskill within potentially organisations they're already in, but also allowing the company to ensure that productivity is maintained? Yeah, so earning and learning is, is definitely becoming an increasingly uh, attractive avenue to recruit and engage uh, both young uh, workers, but also older workers so uh, you know many of the employers that we work with like using kind of a high quality um, distance learning model because it means it can fit round the, the business so I mean I did give the example of the small business that uh, did the the 20 percent off the job training for the apprenticeship on a Friday but many other employers we might work with work with their apprentices to have more flexibility that they might take a Tuesday morning and then a Thursday afternoon uh, one week and then a, a different day the following week to keep that flexibility so they can continue to deliver um, their, their, you know, in the workplace. But also what we need to remember, and I go back to that St Martin's Group report, is actually what those apprentices are learning boost that productivity so yes they are off the job for one day a week but in that they're then bringing they're bringing so much back to the business and bringing a return on investment quite quickly that you're seeing that not just to them as an individual but that halo effect to the business um and i think definitely flexibility as you say and blended online distance learning models are helping that you know it means people can stay in their local community and learn they can learn where they perhaps isn't a local uh, university or an FE college, you know, if you're going to do it through the OU. Um, it might be that that person has a disability or has family commitments. So flexibility for both younger and older workers seems to be the way forward. And I think that flexibility is applied also to, to skills policies um, across the whole of the UK. Of course, we've got four governments working uh, to help boost skills policies and what we at the OU talk about is not just um, a ladder of opportunity where you can move up the skill system but actually it's a, it's a climbing frame of opportunity where you can move between the different skill you know you might need a short course here at one point but then you might want to do your lifelong learning entitlement or an apprenticeship or a higher technical qualification there's lots of different routes in and out you know kickstart blah 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 um, it's about that climbing frame of opportunity throughout your whole life to upskill and reskill. And obviously that's just be going to become more and more acute as uh, the, you know, skill shortages in the long term take hold. Um, you know, AI shifts in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, you know, I think is it the OECD report? In fact, it's the UK Industrial uh, Council talks about 40 percent of people um, misaligned in the skills in their jobs. You know, and all of these jobs that we have now that that aren't going to be around in, by twenty thirty, we need to think about that reskilling and upskilling as a as a climbing frame of opportunity throughout people's lives. And apprenticeships is part of that. Thank you, Laura. Now, Roger, you represent uh, an organisation with twenty five thousand members. So there'll be organisations that are very small and the sole traders, all the way to some of the largest companies in the country. Why is a long-term L&D strategy so important for 
all of those organisations and all of your members? I think uh, what we've seen in the past from government policy when it comes to training is is a very um, ad hoc, uncoordinated and also quite short term approach. Um, you know, the, which has seen certain parts of our education and trade uh, training system increasing size, then shrink back, um, and you know, a lack a lack of consistency and long term thinking, and um, that 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 has been, I think, a big to the detriment of particularly vocational training in the UK, especially when you compare it with some other European countries which you know have done a, particularly thinking about countries like Germany and Switzerland which have done a much better job in in in, in this area so I think you know it, it now is I think the ideal point in which to reconsider that and come together with a proper properly funded thought out uh, long-term plan you know sta standing as we do at a kind of uh, unique moment almost of labour market dislocation I would say um, you know we just a unique moment of mismatch as Laura was saying between where uh, the skills that we need for the future both in the short term and for, to meet the, uh, the long-term challenges that we were talking um, about and where where people are now um, so it's a there's an opportunity for you know for the government to actually put that in place and I think if there was that certainty that um, and you know clarity about about various pathways which are available and how uh, they offer different but equally valuable opportunities to to to, to young people to pursue um, that would be incredibly helpful I do think you know, they're, they're, unfortunately, we well, you know, you could you could see it as a, uh, a fortunate thing or an unfortunate thing, but there is there is still very much a, a very strong focus of our young people on going into a conventional university education. And we still haven't managed to persuade them that there are many other ways in which to to a attain the skills of the future. Um, and it's a be a huge job, I think, to persuade that to persuade everyone that there are other routes and that it, that can only happen if we have a very concerted um you know a, a, a coordinated plan towards learning and development for the for young people thank you so much now matt roger and laura we are drawing this panel to a close but before we do that i would like each of you to please give us some closing remarks and share with our viewers today those business leaders one positive move that they can make tomorrow so that they can take the insights of the business barometer report and take them to their benefit see it as an opportunity and start to address that skills shortage so i'm going to start with matt i'm going to give the rest a little bit of time to prepare then i'm going to move on to roger and we're going to close with laura so matt tell us what can businesses do from tomorrow morning to start some positive action in this area so, I mean, obviously I'm a marketing person, so it's going to sound really fantastic um, and hopefully practical. Um, but if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right at the top is this ability to be self-transcendent. Okay, So everybody is driven by this hierarchy of needs from the very, very functional all the way up to what's going to make me a better version of me. The, the risk that a lot of companies fall into when it comes to learning and development and training is you look at the bottom level only, which is what is going to make this cog a particularly better cog in the context of my business and what my business needs to succeed. And for, from a fulfillment and from a loyalty and from a development of that individual's point of view, that is only addressing the basis of all of the needs that they have, uh, which is just core skills. But if you can shape your learning and development strategy around the top, making that person a better version of themselves, you've already hired them for a job that they are presumably in some way slightly qualified for. So a technical skill level is, is sort of assumed at that, at that point. And you can work on improving those technical skills and upskilling, but making them a better version of who they are themselves in terms of communication, organization, fulfillment, that is for me, that is what you can start by looking at as a different way uh, for your learning and development strategy from, from tomorrow morning onwards. Um, and that's definitely where I would recommend they start. Thank you, Roger. Yes, I suppose my call would be to say to business, see learning development as a key part of your competitive advantage. You know, we're at a moment uh, right now where it's, it's 
difficult to persuade employees back into the workplace. It's difficult to, to actually attract people with the right skills to your organization. Um, use the possibility of training, learning, development, education as a key way to differentiate yourself from, from your competitors. Um, you know, th this will encourage employees, the right employees, the employees you need to see you in a long term way. They'll see you as a way in which they can develop their future career um, for, for at least a, a, a reasonable amount of time. And that's going to be an incredibly important way for you to attract, to attract people to your company in the current environment. And I would argue for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so I would close with um, a phrase that we use a lot here at the OU is that, that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. So I think what we would say to businesses or is, is look where, where your skills deficits are, map those out and I mean, work with partners to help grow your own talent. You know, we've talked about various government initiatives that may come down the track, but actually for right now, there are things we can do to help start growing our own talent or continue to, um, which will support both the business, but also the individuals. And I think will be really transformative as we look to the future and think, look to um, get the economy back on track and, and help support people's well-being and aspirations. Well, thank you so much to our incredible panel for your thought-provoking contributions. The Business Barometer is out now and it includes further insights and views. It can be downloaded from the resources tab on the webinar page or from the Aping University's website at the link shown on the screen. Thank you to everybody who has joined us online. And if you'd like to get in contact with the teams at the Aping University to discuss your skills challenges, please email business at open.ac.uk. We really hope that you enjoyed today's webinar please do visit the Open University at www.open.ac.uk forward slash business and visit the Institute of Directors at www.iod.com. Thank you very much for joining us today and goodbye. Yeah.